It's not exactly news that the newspaper business has been turned upside down and inside out over the past 20 some odd years. And along the way, a lot has fallen by the wayside. Since the early 2000s, more than half of American newspaper jobs have disappeared. More than one in five local papers is closed and local ownership of the papers that are left has dwindled including right here in Boston, where the Phoenix printed its last edition in 2013. The Herald was sold to Digital First Media just last year. The Globe is a lone outlier. And with the winds of change from the rapidly evolving digital space to the ever crazier political landscape still blowing at hurricane force, which outlets are best prepared to extend the future of quality news? It's a question former New York Times executive editor Jill Abramson addresses in her new book. It's called Merchants of Truth, The Business of News and the Fight for Facts, which does a deep dive, I hate that term, <laughs> into the past of two legacy papers, the New York Times and the Washington Post, and two digital-only sites, BuzzFeed and Vice, as they try to adapt. Since its release, Abramson has had to answer questions about certain passages in the book, which at least three writers say were copied from their own work. Jill Abramson joins me now. It's nice to see you. Good to see you. So uh, not so long ago, uh, I was not alone in thinking BuzzFeed and Vice were the future of journalism on the cutting edge, and the New York Times and the Washington Post were the dinosaurs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about to die out. What, what happened along the way? That isn't the way that, it turned out. I thought just like you when I started reporting for this book. And? and the story changed on me How completely. Did it, change? it changed, you know, with the 2016 election and President Trump, who proved to be, you know, gold for both the New York Times and the Washington Post in terms of inspiring great investigative reporting, but bringing like millions of new digital subscribers to both of them. So is isn't so much that they adapt, adopted a new business model, but they adopted a new president. Is that, is that a Well, the president became a pretty good business model and proved, though, that reader revenue, meaning people paying for what they want to read, is a stable and growing source of revenue. But is the old Trump all the time thing about the revenue, or is it about the the news value? And obviously, the overwhelming percentage of the coverage is negative, as people know. Maybe that's merited, but the quantity seems to me to get those, in part at least, to get those digital subscriptions. Is that a fair statement? It's a factor. Like you, I don't think that's why the stories are being done necessarily. But, you know, every story with Trump in the headline gets clicked on. And scale of audience attracts advertising. So does that suggest that if he disappears, either he loses an election, he serves six years, he's removed from office, that this, this growth spurt, disappears in some great newspapers like the Post and the Times? I hope not, and I don't think so. I, you know, maybe the highs that the New York Times is experiencing now won't be as high, but I think people have become more serious about news. Well, except one of my favorite quotes in the whole book is from <laughs> your uh, predecessor, Bill Keller, whose great quote is something like, if luxury porn is what we need to keep the Baghdad mm -hmm. branch open, a bureau open, so be it. I think that was the Thursday style section. And then you're talking, I'm not one who objects to light features. I like the balance kind of thing. But that kind of diversification has also been a key to growth, has it not? Yeah, and becoming much more commercially focused. I mean, the whole area that's called product now in news organizations is, you know, money-making ventures from conferences to trips to, you know, actually sponsored news content. So other than covering Trump, what's the takeaway from 400 pages if people <laughs> want to stay in, as you call it, the quality news business in the future? What you is know, it? that the new quality news has never been more important. It has to survive. Uh, and that it, there's a market for it? There is a market for it, but it's a national market, highly educated and affluent, which is not good news for the little towns in the middle of the country that have lost their local news. I want to talk about local news in a couple of seconds. There's an interesting proposal on Beacon Hill I want to get your thoughts on. I mentioned in the beginning, you've been facing, since the release of this, charges of plagiarism. The first interview I saw you do, you said, quote, it's not an issue at all. Recently you said you made some sloppy mistakes. All along the way you said it wasn't intentional, so it's not plagiarism. Where are you now on that spectrum? What's your response um, that's to that? Where, where the sloppy I mistake am. thing? 
it it was you know footnotes that were not properly attributed in mainly in the beginning years of vice it oh, it's interesting that the objections have all come from vice have the uh, uh, have do you believe that uh, you've been treated fairly by your colleagues in the media on, on this issue or no um, I'm not going to cry victim here. You know, I got, but I the wrote a great, no, you don't. I wrote a great book. It got great reviews. So in that sense, yes, so I feel like I was tre I don't treated mean about fairly. The review of the content. I mean, this whole plagiarism issue, you've been treated. I mean, if when you were running the I New mean, York Times, if a reporter of yours did a variation on what you did, what would you do to that reporter? I would run a correction, correct immediately, be transparent about that and probably do an editor's note. How's this been psychologically for you? It's you have been to, painful. You have to come to every interview knowing that at that, some point after I talk to content, I got to talk about whether I'm a, 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 I plagiarize mm -hmm. someone's work. How does that? What does that do to your head and your? I'm serious. Your mental health when you're um, not doing an interview. It you know it, it's been difficult and painful and it's made me tense and worry that this is going to engulf like the rest of my career. But, you know, the, the thing about events like this is there's no proportionality. It like, you know, rises up like a storm and then, you know, people move on to the next storm. And, you know, but it was a storm worth addressing. I mean, you agree with that? Yes, okay. I mean, I, and I have been very direct, as I am always with interviewers, and not resentful of the questions. Can we uh, talk a little bit about a former colleague, well, a friend and colleague of yours? You wrote a great book, which I've talked to you about, Strange Justice, mm -hmm. the Selling of Clarence Thomas with the great Jane Mayer from mm -hmm. the New Yorker. Her latest is called The Making of the Fox News White House. We know how the president feels about Fox News. Here he is in August of 2018 uh, talking about fake news versus Fox News. Here's the president. The fake news with CNN and MSN, MSNBC is so corrupt. And here's the good news. The guys that we love, right, they're blowing them away in the ratings. Hannity, Laura Ingram, Tucker Carlson. You know, maybe I'm naive, but when I read Jane's piece and I read about Lou Dobbs, calling in to White House meetings as they're happening to give advice. Sean Hannity finishing his show at 10 o'clock and almost every night calling in and speaking to the president to end the day. What, what are we to make? Should we be surprised or what do we make of this? I mean, I was surprised by some of the revelations in Jane's great piece, including the fact that debate questions, yeah. including the famous Megyn Kelly one about calling women pigs, were leaked to him by Fox. So I don't have any data to back this up, but I'm pretty confident in saying I would bet Fox News doesn't lose one viewer over these uh, revelations. Oh. If, if I'm close to right, you're nodding in agreement. What does that say? It says that, you know, we are a polarized country where conservatives and, you know, angry people are very attracted to Fox News and think that's where you get your facts. And people who are Democrats and lean left think Fox is is the real fake news. You know, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, Jill, the local news, and you talk about layoffs, buyouts, restructuring in your book. You quote a publisher, I think an outgoing publisher of a Denver newspaper, saying local papers are more like ad supplements than they are newspapers. There's a bill in the Massachusetts legislature that would set up, I think, a 17-member commission to address what the, the sponsor calls uh, media deserts in part mm -hmm. of Massachusetts around the country. Are you comfortable with government looking into that issue and potentially proposing solutions to those holes in coverage? I'm not a fan of government solutions for news issues in general. But is there a but or no? So what's the solution well, to the disappearance of local news? Well, you know, we are news? seeing, you know, billionaires and more people donating to nonprofits like ProPublica, which tries to 
fill the desert with great investigative reporting that it partners and billionaires with. buying newspapers to make money. You think Jeff Bezos is was a good move? Do you not? There's John oh, Henry in Boston. Move. So so and you know the Globe, like the Post, says you know they're in 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 much better shape. They're making profit. What worries you most about the future of, again, quality news, as uh, you say, well, after this work? Well, the thing that worries me the most is that it's so fundamental to the health of our democracy. And? And it's endangered, except in, you know, a few very strong places. So the big will survive, but you know, local news is the most trusted news. Closest it's to closest the people. to the people. And you know, what, that, what the founders wanted is for you and me to be the watchdogs. And it scares me to death that you know, there are no watchdogs covering county council, state- Poll commissions, I yeah. agree. You know what the other, the founders also wanted? They wanted reporters from major newspapers not to tweet their opinions. Yeah, every, so I, I know you agree. we're agreed on Jill, that. Jill, it's good to see you. Thank you so much, Thanks Jim. Thanks so much. Again, the book is The Merchants of Truth, The Business of News, and The Fight for Facts.